OK, is that working? Great. OK. So yeah, my name is uh, Camden, and I'm from UCI in, the Dr. in Dr. Morozavi's lab. And uh, today I want to talk about my software, Somatic, which is used for making self-organizing maps, which is a way to um, let you visualize highly dimensional data sets that ENCODE uses. So um, today I'm going to talk about a little bit of background, like what is a self-organizing map? Why would you use one? I'm going to do an in-depth description of how you train a self-organizing map, so those that are bioinformaticians will know sort of what the algorithm does. Uh, I'll talk about how to use the software to build your own self-organizing map, and then I will do a tutorial on how to use the self-organizing map viewer, which lets you basically uh, supply a website to anybody that wants to look at your data, um, and then they'll be able to explore your data set at their own leisure. So. Um, so the basic part of the problem is that data sets that are above three dimensions uh, cannot be visualized easily. And uh, humans are pretty good at looking at graphs or looking at uh, visual representations of their data and being able to make sense of it. Uh, but computers are not the greatest at it. So in order to uh, analyze uh, very dim highly dimensional data sets, there, there should be a way to, to visualize it so you can look at it yourself. Um, so there's already a system for doing that called PCA, uh, which attempts to reduce the dimensions of your data set. Um, but the problem with PCA is that it assumes uh, a lot about your data set, that it's a linear uh, set, um, a space, and uh, also every time you drop a dimension from your data set, you lose a lot of spatial information. So we'd like to be able to do that without losing any spatial information. So that is done through self-organizing maps, which is a nonlinear PCA. Um, uh, and I'll talk about how to use them. So, um, so SOMs are sort of like a, uh, like a 3D stack of images. Um, each slice of this stack represents a different experiment or a different dimension of your data set. And each of these slices is divided into a bunch of hexagons, these units. Um, and these represent a cluster of uh, genomic, genomic segments or genes or go terms that have the same profile across all of the different experiments that you ran. Um, for this particular SOM, we're running it on a toroid, so the uh, top and the bottom are, so the, so the whole thing is edgeless, so if you go off the bottom, you come up the top, and if you go off the left, you come off the right, um, so you don't have to worry about any weird edge cases or anything like that. Uh, these SOMs can be used to mine for interesting results, like in the human and mouse encode papers uh, we found some interesting results, and then Morozavi in a recent paper also found some interesting results related to using uh, self-organizing maps. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how the algorithm works very briefly. Um, so the first thing that you have to do is you have to build a training matrix um, for your data. In the future, my software will include ways of segmenting your genome automatically. But you're going to have to figure out your own way of segmenting your genome. You can use Chrome HMM. You could just segment your genome by every kilobase, however you want to segment it. And you're going to want to build a matrix which has your segments as the rows of the matrix, and then as the columns, the, um, the RPKMs of your particular experiment in that particular genome segment. So there's a bunch of different ways you can segment the genome, and uh, I could talk about that later. So, um, the algorithm will initialize a toroid, which is how it's edgeless, um, with your genome segments at random. And then for um, each time step, it'll take a vector um, from that training matrix. It'll find the unit in the uh, map that it's closest to in terms of profile. And then we'll pull that unit and the units around it closer to that training vector. So in the end, um, oh, yeah, and then every single time step, it'll also reduce the radius and the uh, learning rate. So over time, the map will train to become like a representation of your experiment space. So uh, in order to let people make their own self-organizing maps, um, I created a tool called Somatic. Uh, it's built to be very general. It'll work for any sort of coordinate system you put into it. So if you've got genes or microRNA or uh, mi mac microarrays or whatever, you can um, put it into the segment uh, segmentation column on the first column, and it will just work with it. Um, 
Also, I built the uh, tool to uh, be sort of hackable in a way that all the output files are there. So if you would like to make a script to sort of throw your own overlays on top, or if you want to make your own maps customly, that's all supported um, by the, uh, the tool. Uh, also, it'll automatically build a website so that you can view your maps in a visual way instead of like combing through uh, reams of data like you would with any other SOM tool out there. Um, so there's some requirements for using Somatic. I wrote Somatic in C++ to try and make it as fast as possible. Um, obviously, over time, I'm gonna make it more efficient, but as it is, it's, it's a much faster than any tool that's out there right now. Uh, but you need to have G++ version 2.8.2. Uh, .2. You can check that by running um, that command on your terminal. Uh, Somatic has also been built and tested in a Linux environment, but I've heard that some people have been running it on their Macs and it works okay, so that's great. Um, and uh, just, just know that I'm only, I'm only testing it for use for a, like a high performance cluster or whatever. Um, yeah, so the SOM viewer itself needs to be placed on a web uh, server. You can actually build your own web server locally on your own computer by downloading Apache and just running it on like your local host. Um, but uh, the best way to use it is to put it on a web server for like your lab or, um, or your own personal like high performance club, uh, cluster. Um, and uh, it'll allow you to share that with all of your colleagues, all of your lab mates that wanna explore your data set. Uh, there's one other uh, little thing that's required for this to work is the Apache server has to have its directory listings turned on. Uh, that's so that the program itself can look through all the maps that you've created and sort of create a website custom every time it's run. So you can download the latest version uh, off of our server at cric.bio.eci.edu. Uh, um, uh, if you just go to the somatic part of that address, there will also be a very simple page that describes some previous editions that have been released. It's the feature set, you know, what's coming soon, and that will constantly be updated, especially over the summer, uh, as I improve it with more and more features. Uh, so you wanna make sure that your GCC version is, is, is uh, higher and, and is loaded correctly by running the G++ version there. And then you can untar the somatic folder that you just downloaded, and you just go inside of the bin directory and hit make, and it should just build it all for your current system. Uh, so there's two files that are required uh, for running this program. The first one is the training matrix that I discussed earlier. The first column, uh, and this is a tab delimited file, the first column is all of the uh, segments that you're trying to run it on. It doesn't have to be genome coordinates like it is in this example. It could just be gene names, like if you're running from an RNA-seq data set or whatever. Uh, and then all the RPKMs, which is the data you're running it on, are in a tab delimited format after it. And you can have as many um, columns in that as you'd like, as many experiments as you'd like. Um, right, so there's an example training matrix inside of the examples folder in Somatic if you're not sure about what the, um, the style is supposed to be. There's another file that you need, which is your sample list, which is basically the, number, the, the experiments that you ran, uh, which correspond to the columns uh, of the training matrix. Um, and there's an example sample list at the uh, example folder. Oh, um, be careful when you're naming your, uh, your samples because this is the naming convention that the website uses for people to look at. So you wanna make sure it's in a human readable format. So um, you just run this uh, script that I've created called build site. It's inside of the scripts folder. Um, it takes a bunch of uh, different options. It, you, know, you have to give your SOM a name. You have to show, tell it where the training matrix is. You have to tell how many rows and columns you want for your, for your, um, for your, for your uh, neural network. Uh, and that, those numbers depend upon how complex your particular experiment is. Um, if it's like a very simple, like only a couple of dimensions, you might want a smaller map. Uh, but if it's like a super complicated, like you know, 96 dimensional single cell RNA data set or something, you might want larger, like maybe 30 by 50 or something like that. Um, there's a bunch of uh, like suggestions for how big your thing should be, but because it's a neural network, it's sort of a, it depends exactly on your, on your data set, which ones you want to use. So you want to try a bunch of those. Uh, and then you want to put them on the, the, the sample list file, the location for that. Uh, you want to put how long you'd like to run your SOM. We typically run it for about four million time steps, but that can depend upon how many segments you're using. You want to use more time steps for, ha for having more segments in your genome. 
And then um, because it has a random initialization, sometimes the SOM can get stuck in a local minima. So you want to run the SOM like three or four times, and it will take the one with the best score at the end. So that would be the number of trials. So this program will run like five or six different scripts that train the SOM, score it, uh, generate your, self your maps, generates a summary, which is a sum of all your maps, uh, and then it creates this website out of a TGZ that's actually in that folder also. Um, so there's a couple of overlays that you can optionally add on top of this would require some additional files. Um, the first one you can do is you can add a gene overlay uh, if you're using like uh, uh, genomic coordinates. So for each unit, you'll be able to see what genes are inside of the unit instead of just the genome coordinates. Um, and you can run this script called getgenes. It should be getgenes.sh, but I must have messed it up on the slide. Um, it's also inside of the scripts folder. And uh, it takes a couple of options, one of which is a gene annotations file. Uh, you also need to tell what method of, of uh, which great algorithm, because it uses great to calculate the, the genes that are inside of each uh, genome coordinate. Um, and then if you've got like a GTF file, which has a very strange like chromosome, like I know like for the, uh, for the mouse GTF file, it doesn't actually have CHR before the chromosome, it just has the chromosome number. So you can actually like put an option in there to add chromosome to that when you're doing all the comparisons. Otherwise it won't be able to recognize because two is not the same as chromosome two, so. Um, so, you know, here's some directions on how to basically run this program. You can get this particular GTF file uh, from uh, Ensemble and uh, open it up and then you just run the get genes uh, script on that uh, GTF file using the, ex uh, the example uh, that we have. Uh, again, this is a mouse uh, example. So there's a next, the next thing you can add is a uh, go term overlay. Um, the go term overlay is a, little, is, is a little bit in beta right now, but it it's works okay, so go ahead and give it a, give it a shot. Um, you can see the go enrichments that are in each unit instead of just seeing the genes, so you could see, you know, oh, this area is rich in like regulation of heart contractions or something, right? Um, so to do that, you run this particular script. You need to get a couple of files for this script also. One is the gene to go file, which you get from NCBI, and the other one is a gene info file, which you can also get from NCBI for your particular organism. Um, I've also included in the readme file, if you don't, yes. Uh, so question, so what exactly is the output of your program? Is it, it a text it's a file? It's a website. It's a website? Yes. All right, cool. I'll, I'll go over what the output looks like uh, at the end. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, but the website itself has a bunch of like output files inside of it. So if you go inside like the data folder in the website, you can actually look and see what all the maps are, all the genes, all of the Go terms, and do your own scripts on those. So I built it to be very hackable and, and open for people to use. Um, Right, where was I? Uh, yeah, so this is for the Go term uh, enrichment. And uh, in the README file for this program, I've included, if you want to make your own gene info file, like if your organism is not supported by NCBI, you can make your own gene info file pretty easily. It tells you which columns my program uses, and so you can build your own uh, file. Okay, so um, I have an example website up on, at the somatic uh, website for you guys to look at. Um, it's at example website. Um, there's also a link to it from the somatic um, HTML page if you guys wanna follow along. So let me, uh, let me go to my, my web page here. All right, so this doesn't look fantastic because the resolution on these projectors are terrible, but um, uh, when you start up the website, it'll show you the summary map, which is basically the um, addition of all of the units from all of your different experiments. Um, so you can see which areas are highly enriched across all of your experiments and which areas are, are lowly enriched. And because um, it's a toroid, you can use these arrow um, on the side of the map to scroll it around. And it will keep that um, the same across all of the maps you look at. So whenever you're looking at maps side by side, you know for a fact that the, the, the hexagons um, line up with each other. 
So like say for example, we wanted to look at uh, like H3KO4 ME1 inside of whole brain. So this particular uh, setup was um, a bunch of different mouse organs and cell types. Uh, chip seek data, a uh, bunch of histone modifications, like four different histone modifications. Um, so on the right here, we can see all of the areas on the SOM that are enriched uh, in the whole brain at this particular histone mark. So that's kind of neat. Uh, you can also compare that with another whole brain, like maybe H3K27. So you can look at these two side by side, and you can see that there's areas that are high in one data set and low in the other one. Right? So like say for example we're interested in what's happening like here, right? We can click on that unit and we can see exactly what the, what the, uh, the uh, enrichment level is for that unit. We can see all of the segments, the genome segments that have landed inside of that unit. And this file, which is up in the URL, is just sitting on your web server. So if you're interested in like doing some more statistical analysis on that, that's totally up to you. Um, you can also view all of the genes that are in that segment, and these genes are all genes that have the same profile across all of your different experiments, which is pretty cool. And then you can also view all of the go terms that have been enriched in this unit that have a higher uh, percentage uh, of happening than the, act, than, the, than the average. So you can see the first term is the uh, p-value, which, uh, which is corrected with Bonferroni, um, and then you've got all the different go terms that are in that unit. Uh, another cool feature is you can go to the Go Terms tab, which will download all of the particular maps for all the Go Terms in your, in your system. And you can look for a Go Term that you like. So like, say for example, we're interested in like neuronal, like regulation of neurotransmitter levels, right? So we can click on that one. We can go down to the map, and here's all of the units in your map that have that Go Term. So you can like look at them, Again, the resolution sort of messing with my mouse clicking a little bit. And you can see that it's, uh, it's higher in uh, H3K04ME1 in these areas and um, lower in H3K27 in these areas. And that might mean something to you um, for your particular experiment, right? So there's one more cool feature, which are these groups. So um, let me see if that works with the Go term or not. I'm not sure. Anyway. So <laughs> you can like put a name for your group, and this will group up all of the SOMs you have currently loaded. So like say that I, I want to load up the other brain uh, SOMs like that. And then I go to the groups and I put in whole brain, right? And I add these selected to the group. So now I can activate and deactivate that whole group of SOMs with just one click. I can set a minimum and max. The, um, the scale bars currently are set automatically based upon the uh, enrichment in you, this particular data, but if you want them all to be the same across all of them, you can just set a minimum and maximum and then hit set. So let's like set a minimum of like point like 0025 and set a maximum of like point uh, 022 or something like that. And then you can hit set. And then all of the maps will automatically, in that group will take that, um, those, those scale bars. Uh, there's another cool feature where you can see the average of all of those maps that you selected by hitting the average button, and it will show you the whole brain average, which is all of the enrichments for those particular things that you have selected. So that's kind of that's cool. There's also a bunch of like uh, figure making tools. So if you want to make a figure for a paper, you can like select like the square and make a square, and then you can like rotate it. And it'll show up across all of the different ones that you've got active. And then you can like click on the X and get rid of it and get rid of that to, to start clicking again. Um, you can make different colors. So like say you want a red triangle over these for your figure. So you can just do that and then like rotate it to whatever you want, right? Um, so that is the tool. And then so that means I can go to acknowledgments. So. I want to thank my, uh, my lab, especially Dr. Mortarzavi, uh, who really helped me with this um, project. I'd like to thank Ricardo Ramirez and uh, Benny Zhang, uh, who you know, did experiments for me to run this data on. Um, and then everybody in the lab. I'd also like to thank my Hudson Alpha Lead Encode production group. I'd like to thank the HPC at UCI 
And um, like, thank you guys for listening. That's it. Uh, there was any questions? Yes. So many problems with microphones today. <laughs> so could we look at your um, tor toroidal heat maps again for a second, please? Sure. So, so just in general terms, like how many windows wide and how many windows high is each one of those? Uh, you mean the maps? Yeah. The maps are about half, or depending on the resolution of your monitor, right? Like this resolution is very small, but normally it fits like a third, you can fit like three maps on one screen. No, no, what, what I'm asking mm -hmm. is, if you're scrolling over the surface of a toroid, oh, yes. how do you know when you've explored all the space? So this, this is just like a, a rectangular representation of the toroid. So like if you take the top and the bottom and you just sort of wrap them around, and you take the left and the right and wrap them around, you make the toroid, right? So this is the whole, the whole toroid that's on there. Right, but what, what I'm trying to ask is, mm -hmm. if there are no edges, how do you know when you're done looking around? Well, this is the whole thing, so you're, you're automatically done looking around. It just lets you put the whole thing on. It just lets you put the whole, like, so sometimes you, you, you'll have a map that's, like, half off the screen. So, like, sorry, my computer's a little slow right now. So, like, say you get a map that looks like this when you first start out, right? But you know that this here is actually here also, so you can click around and put it all, like, on one area to look at. Okay, thanks. So I don't really understand your question. <laughs> Is that, did that answer it? I'll catch you later. Okay. Um, yes. So can we uh, do a subtraction between any two groups? Between that groups? is an oncoming feature. Okay. And yes. the second thing is that can we parallelize it? At, la at least we, if you can uh, run the different trials simultaneously. Um, that's a future feature for that, yeah. Multi-threading multi and stuff, that's all, that's all coming down the, in the future. Uh, as it is, the training is actually pretty quick. The thing that takes the longest is adding the Go um, overlay, but that should be multi-threaded also. So that we should, we, I should change that for that. And because in, in our um, place, it's, um, we cannot have directory listing enabled. Say that again? We, do not, we cannot have directory listing enabled, so if you can, any workaround. Um, I'm gonna try and figure out a way around that, um, but uh, sometimes web servers have problems with with their with the programs running on them poking around, um, and they're ha you know it's like security issues and stuff. Yeah. So I have to like look into that and see if that's possible. Um, if if that's a serious problem, you can actually run it locally on your computer in your own Apache like local host. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Yes. Um, you mentioned the source of the gene ontology files. Yes. Um, NCBI has nothing to do with that, um, um, and, and because it comes from a consortium that I and others founded about 18 years ago called okay. the Gene Ontology Consortium. You can go to geneontology.org. Oh, I've got, uh, I've got the, I, I take your OBO files um, from, from that website. From uh, but the actual, like, the, 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 the conversion between Go terms and gene names. Would you get it from NCBI? Yeah, because they've okay. got a bunch of different um, organisms already created for that purpose, right? Yeah, which the Gene Ontology Consortium has created. So, oh, so, so. okay. Sorry. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Okay, Fantastic. if there's no more questions, like uh, uh, thank all the speakers in the session. Oh. oh. Oh, uh, the, um, the, you mean how the hexagons are, are connected in the, in the map? Yeah, so the um, hexagons that are near each other are closer together in the experiment space, so their profiles are si more similar. Um, that's just um, that's just the standard, uh, like, it just uses the vectors from the training matrix and trains on them, right? So the training matrix themselves create the profiles. Okay, let's thank the speakers. Thank you.